But when I started to question how useful this way of thinking was that everything I turned my hand to had to be perfect, well, let's just say I actually started getting a lot more things done. Hello, and welcome to Sharp, the podcast where we help you get a little better at the stuff you have to do, so you can spend more time doing the stuff you want to do. So now, on with the episode. Hello, and welcome to episode 47. Now, before we start, I've got a bit of a change to announce. You've probably noticed that this episode is out a bit later than usual. It's only a few days later, but we have missed our usual Sunday twice weekly deadline. And that's because some stuff's changed for me. I'm sure I've mentioned it before. This podcast takes quite a lot of time to write and prepare and put together. So I've had two choices to think about recently. The first choice is to carry on pumping it out once every fortnight, but reduce the amount of content and possibly reduce the quality, or I can reduce the frequency and have the podcast come out monthly and make sure there's lots of good content. So obviously, I'm going to go for the monthly option. So instead of fortnightly, from the next episode, this will come out monthly, and that then gives you four weeks to download, enjoy, catch up on back episodes, and most importantly, see if you can put things into practice. After all, You can't keep trying new things every week or every two weeks, can you? So, from episode 48, it will be a monthly dose of development, ideas and tips, all wrapped up in the high-quality format that you've come to know and love, hopefully, and a format where we don't take ourselves too seriously. So that starts in October, but you have this full episode to listen to now. So, what's in store for episode 47? Well, I'm going to tell you. In 1988, the group Fairground Attraction released a song called Perfect. It went to number one in the UK, South Africa and Australia, and it won the award for the best single at the following year's Brit Awards. The song Perfect has been used for a number of advertising campaigns for different retail companies, including a company that I used to work for. Why am I telling you this? Well, in 1988, I was a driven year old retail manager. I'm sorry, can we bleep that out, please? Me admitting that I was 20 in 1988. I was a certain age retail manager who wanted to succeed. I wanted to win. I wanted to be the best at what I did. And like the song of the same name, everything I did had to be perfect. And what's wrong with that? I mean, many of us work hard to succeed and often we're driven to success by high standards. But how high should our standards be, and is there a risk to aiming for perfection? Could it have a negative impact? Well, join us and find out why perfectionism isn't all it's cracked up to be, and what that's got to do with swimming pools, interviews, and serious mental health issues. I'm going to tell you a story. I bet none of you remember Max Bygraves. If you remember Max Bygraves, please send me a message via, you'd probably have to send me a fax. I'm going to tell you a story and it's a bit cliched and it's meant to be. We're at the shiny reception area at the huge London marketing firm, Miller, Baker and Candlestick Maker. And we're here to meet John Carter, who's here for an interview. Right on cue, John walks in and he strides over to the vast, steel-fronted reception desk. He leans against the walnut counter, flashes his best smile at the receptionist and announces himself. John Carter, I've got a two o'clock interview with Stephanie Von Hulikinson and Keith Karahalahalahan. The receptionist smiles, impressed by his pronunciations as she telephones through to the boardroom. Ten minutes later, John is in the boardroom and he is flying. He's done his research, he knows the business inside out, he's even checked out the people who are interviewing him on LinkedIn and invited them to his network. He delivers a killer presentation. First they're laughing, then they're interested. 
Then their admiration shows as he brings it to a clever, witty and meaningful conclusion. Next, the interview itself. He has prepared for every question. Nothing is phasing him. They're trying to find fault and they just can't. He's almost there. Their final question. John, how would you describe your weaknesses? That's easy, he says. So I did both bits in his voice, didn't I? That's easy, he says. I'm a perfectionist. I know it's not really a weakness, but it is an area that burns in me. Everything has to be right. Good enough is not good enough. Suddenly, the room is quiet. The panel look down at their paperwork and write silently. Outside the boardroom, the receptionist has dropped a pin, and you can hear it like a deafening clang in the room. Could you drop a pin, please? Stephanie looks up. Thanks, John. We'll contact you. Please see yourself out. John leaves. He forgets to shake their hands. Outside, it's raining, and John turns his raincoat collar up against the wind and steps into the dismal London street. OK, that was a lesson in spot. The cliché, I think I counted about 15. But that answer to that particular question about weakness, my weakness is I'm a perfectionist, is one of the biggest clichés. And it's well recognised as being a canned and inauthentic answer in an interview. But have you ever considered that as a weakness, perfectionism is potentially a fairly big one? So this episode is about perfectionism or being a perfectionist. Now, while some people might think that it's something to aspire to, I've discovered that not only does it have its dark side, but in fact, it might not even help at all. So now we're going to go back in time to the 1970s, and I'm standing in my swimming trunks. Well, I remember this swimming pool distinctly. It's been demolished now. But back in the 1970s, Victoria Bath was the place where all the kids in Portsmouth learned to swim. I learned the hard way. My dad threw me in the deep end and I had no choice but to make it to the other side. Something else happened with my dad at that swimming pool. And him and I disagree about whether this really happened or not. We'd been having some sort of competition in the pool. I think it was who could swim the furthest underwater or something. And afterwards, we were in the changing rooms talking about it and how he'd won again. And I said, I'll beat you one day. And I distinctly remember him saying, you'll never be better than me. Now, to this day, I get this very real sense of the impact that this one sentence had on me. I can feel it now in my stomach. I feel dejected, not good enough. And while I'm entirely sure that my dad didn't mean that to happen at all, this dejection and this poor opinion of myself transformed into this competitive fire that burned for probably about 20 to 25 years of my adult life. And boy, was I competitive. I had to win at everything. Whether it's being the first person to respond to an email, whether it's doing the best presentation, I would spend four hours on a Sunday afternoon cleaning my car so it was the shiniest in the company car park on a Monday morning. I mean, literally, I had to win at everything. Now, the good news is, I'm cured now. Uh, I began to realise that not everything's a competition about eight to ten years ago when other things started to become important. But I believe that hand in hand with that extreme level of competitiveness was also this quality of perfectionism. Now, perfectionism is a, is a problem I've overcome. Um, I'm not completely, people will say. You'll probably find out from Lisa later on. But certainly, more recently, uh, it's, it's much less of a challenge for me. Up until about five years ago, I thought that being a perfectionist was an out-and-out out good thing. But when I started to question how useful this way of thinking was, that everything I turned my hand to had to be perfect, well, let's just say I actually started getting a lot more things done. Now, I'm not entirely over it. I am a lot better than I was which is why I found researching for this episode really interesting.
Now these days, you don't have to look very far to see examples of perfection that we and our kids are never going to live up to. Whether it's social media, the internet, even some podcasts are places ripe with this narrative that you have to achieve, win, succeed, and if you don't have a washboard stomach, a footballer's income, and a Bugatti Veyron, then you're just not worth talking to. Now, I don't know about you, but there aren't any Bugatti Veyrons parked down our street, and everyone I talk to seems to be quite relaxed about that. You see, we know intellectually, don't we, that people out there are only showing us their absolute best bits on social media. I guess a healthy level of motivation and role modelling is a good thing. But later on, we'll look at some worrying research that suggests that this perpetuation of aspiring to the perfect life is potentially risking the future of some of our younger population. Now, you might have an idea of where you think you would sit on this scale of perfectionism. But first, what actually is perfectionism? And if we know what it is, how can it affect us And is there a way of dealing with it? Well, I'm going to give you the answers to all those things now. It was apparently Voltaire who said that perfect is the enemy of good. And this is taken to mean that if you aim for perfection every time, you may not actually produce anything because you won't accept good. So what do we mean by perfectionism? in the real world. Well, you might be pleased to know that Lisa and I had a chat about it over the table. Yes, she's back, and here we are talking about perfectionism across, I have to say, a pristinely clean dining table. It's recording. (laughs) Hello. Are you going to do a bit about living with a per... per, I can't say the word, Steve. How am I going to do this when I can't say it? Perfect. Perfectism. Perfectionism. Why can't you get it right? <laughs> <laughs> I've told you, we practice this 50 times because it has to be perfect. Perfect. Oh. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <coughs> say it for me, say the word. Perfectionism. Perfectionism. Yeah, yeah but what do you say if someone's got perfect, perfective quality, perfection? just perfectionism isn't it i think so they're a perfectionist okay so have you got anything about being the daughter of a perfectionist parent interestingly later on in the episode i give some coping ideas about how to deal with people including family members where nothing is good enough and how to deal with those criticisms i may listen then (laughs) Yeah. That strikes a chord, let's Mr not, O'Neill. Let's not name any names. <laughs> but um, So I, I will have already referred in the podcast to the fact that I used to be, this was quite a strong tendency for me. It's a lot, um, I think it, it's backed off a bit more so than it, than it was before. But it's still something that is, you know, I've sat here and got this microphone at exactly the right height ready for us to record. By two millimetres. By two millimetres. So I have high standards. So the podcast is about perfectionism. Hello, Lisa. Hello. <laughs> what was the last thing we talked about here at the at the um, table? At the table. I don't know. We've been how long have we been here now? Four, five four, months. Four or five months, and we I think we've only done it once yeah. so i i do know for a fact that your listeners will have really missed me i know they will and and they'll be very pleased to uh, to hear your back one in particular you know who you are <laughs> so we're talking about perfectionism and um i just thought it might be interesting to because when i started researching this you, you know we all know people who we can say who are perfectionists but a lot of that is about what we mean by perfectionist So the purpose of this conversation is for for us to discuss between us what perfectionism actually is. So what do you think perfectionism is? Um, So I would say that it's someone um, who gets uptight about really small details that I don't necessarily understand makes a big difference. I'm just checking the levels (laughs) while you were talking. I, I really was. 
I think this, you know, I, I know some of the content because we've discussed some of the yeah. research that you've done because it is really interesting. And I think now that I understand the different types, I can relate some of the people in my life to different types of perfectionism. So what would you say generally are the sorts of things that you think people who are perfectionists, what do they do? Move the microphone stand by two millimetres and I don't understand that that's going to make a big difference. That's just high standards. Okay, so it's, it. I mean, I'm, I'm saying it a bit joking, yeah. but I know that you're actually getting really uptight that my bangles are clanging as we're recording this. And I also know that I get, um, I get, not up, uptight's too strong a word, but I see, for instance, someone might do a really fantastic piece of work mm. um, that someone, naming no names, m just keeps going, keeps adjusting, keeps moving the goalpost to get it better and better and better without necessarily keeping an eye on what I call the bigger picture. So is that investment, at, are you going to get payback for mm. all those tiny little details? Mm. But having said that, I think, you know, having lived with you for a long time now, and this isn't obviously about you, because we're not talking about anyone in particular, but I think that I have improved some of my standards on certain things and become less kind of take it or leave it about some things mm. I recognize that there is value in mm. trying to get things as good as you possibly can whereas I think historically I'd have gone well oh, that's pretty good and I think I think that um extreme perfectionism is there is there is there is no um there's no point at which you you draw the line and say that's good enough extreme perfectionism is Nothing is ever good enough, and I suppose That's I see I see that as really destructive. Yeah, because I've lived in an environment where that has been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Reality, big impact. Um, I and I, and seeing that influence with my son, I can see that that mm. is actually destructive, and actually can relate that some of the what I call oversensitivity as an adult mm. stems from never feeling good enough yeah, yeah. what I did as a child. So I've learned that there, um, there's two different kinds of perfectionism. So there's um, adaptive perfectionism and maladaptive. And it, it's pretty self-explanatory. Adaptive is the kind that you and I might just call high standards. You know, the, someone who has adaptive perfectionism does things well, um, submits their work on time, but they don't overdo it. So do they see things in context? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a there's a there's a point at which they say that now is good enough. Yeah. Whereas maladaptive is where nothing's good enough. So the standards are are literally things need to be perfect. And what happens then is the person gets they get hindered, they get held back mm. because of the level they're trying to achieve. Um, and then what I also learned is as well as there being two different, as well as there being sort of levels of adaptive or maladaptive, there are also different types of perfectionism. So a couple of guys in um, in Ontario and Calendar in 1991. You need to re-say that because you said Clarendor. I thought I said Calendar, actually. <laughs> you live in a calendar. <laughs> There's a place in Scotland called Canada. Um, but these guys were in Canada, <laughs> in Ontario. <laughs> Hewitt and Flett. And they define three different types of perfectionism. So the first one is self-oriented perfectionism. So what do you think self-oriented perfectionism Well, that's is? about wanting to do things perfectly yourself. Yes. Yeah. And at, at the extreme level, this is about setting really high standards and being intolerant of making mistakes in your own work so this so this person who is maladaptive must never be late for something or they get really agitated if any aspect of something that they're responsible for falls short of oh, perfect you see that might be a bit you see i can see some traits myself in that description yeah and i think the important thing to bear in mind is that perfectionism is not on or off what I've learned is there's a scale. So there will be some things that you'll recognise about you, I'll recognise about me. Hopefully our listeners will recognise about themselves. 
and then see some benefit in, well, maybe I want to tweak that a bit, or maybe, so I don't think we should think of it as something that is extreme, and you know, it's either you either don't have it or it's really extreme. Um, the second one then is other oriented, so the first one we had is self-oriented perfectionism where the person has to be perfect about their own stuff. What's other oriented perfectionism, do you think? I think, Steve, it might be about intolerance around other people's inability to reach perfection. Perfect that word. Yes, I'm not happy with the standard of your delivery. <laughs> <coughs> but yes. I can't. So why have I got a blank around this word? Okay. Perfectionism. So yeah, other ori other oriented perfectionism was de was defined by these guys as where. Um, someone applies those same expectations to other people. Mm. So they get frustrated when other people make mistakes or don't meet that person's exacting standards. And then there's a third category, which is socially prescribed perfectionism. Mm. What do you think that is? This really makes me feel uncomfortable. So this mm. is a level of perfectionism that um, your social environment inflicts on you. So, yeah. like our kids with social media and mm -hmm. looking at Instagram and seeing mm -hmm. this level of perfect world that they think they they have to aspire to. Yeah. And this category is interesting because the person themselves wouldn't describe themselves as a perfectionist, but they they feel like there's pressure from society, from friends, from colleagues, from family to live up to these really unrealistic expectations. So there's maladaptive and adaptive in terms of level, and then there's three kinds of, perfe of perfectionism. Uh, there's self-oriented, um, there's other-oriented, and then there's socially prescribed. The danger area is the maladaptive perfectionism in the socially prescribed area. There is some work that has identified that that is a growing problem, and it's a bigger problem more recently than it ever was. So I think, I think for me, having done this research, I've learned that perfectionism, perfectionism in calendar um, isn't on or off. It isn't something someone's either got or they haven't got, but actually everybody's on a scale. What do you think? Yes. Say perfectionism. I can't. <laughs> say per it better. Perfectionism. See, I can do it when I think about it and think slowly. I just can't say it in a sentence. Mm. So how many perfectionists do you know? Do you work with any perfectionists, do you think? Um, and say names. I think I work with people with some perfectionism qualities, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I work with extreme perfectionists. Yeah, yeah. And do you recognise any of the things we've talked about in you? Yes. And obviously you don't recognise any in me because I'm perfect. <laughs> I'm going to press stop now and drink some wine. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. It's oh, been it's a while. My we must do it again soon. Let's. It might seem obvious that at the far end of the scale, life is difficult when you're a maladaptive perfectionist. And you might assume that this quality is rare. What surprised me when I was researching this episode is that this is more of a problem than I realised, and it's growing. Thomas Curran and Andrew Hills carried out a meta-analysis of 42,000 undergraduates from 1989 to 2016. And they were measuring for those three different kinds of perfectionism, the ones we talked about at the table. And the outcome was that the findings indicate that recent generations of young people perceive that others are more demanding of them, that they are more demanding of others, and they're more demanding of themselves. There were increases across all three of those categories, but the largest rise was in the socially prescribed perfectionism category, the one that's characterised by the feeling that others have high demands of us. In fact, there was a 32% increase from 1989 to 2016. And according to Curran, the reason that that's so problematic is that's the dimension most strongly correlated with serious mental illness. Now, a separate study at the University of North Carolina in 2016 
shows a correlation between self-reported perfectionism and psychopathology. So things like depression or anxiety disorders, and even early mortality and suicide. Now, you might think that's extreme, and you might be right. Remember, this is a correlation, not a causation. There's a suggestion these things are connected, but the suggestion isn't that the perfectionism is causing the mental illnesses. However, even if you're not at risk of mental health problems, how useful is being a perfectionist anyway? What are the downsides of this trait? There are actually more than I realised. So I did some digging to find out what the downsides are, and there are actually quite a lot. And one particular article on careeraddict.com sums up the six key problems that I see appearing again and again in regard to perfectionism. So here's this week's rundown of the perfectionist affliction charts. In at number six, short-sightedness. So this is about perfectionists being so obsessed by the little details, they miss the bigger picture. At number five, poor relationships. So if you're a perfectionist, you might find that you're actually putting pressure on the people around you to meet your standards. Number four, poor health. So often perfectionists are workaholics, and that means that they sacrifice regeneration time, like recreation or even food and sleep, for the sake of work. So that combination means that they're actually likely to experience not only poor physical health, but poor mental health. Challenge number three, stagnation. Perfectionists tend to not pay attention to what other people say because they believe that the way they do things is the right way. What that means is they then don't get exposed to other people and they don't learn stuff. They don't get exposed to new ideas and they can actually stagnate. Number two, so the second biggest challenge is low productivity. So when a perfectionist takes on a task or a project, they have a, they have a tendency to get into too much detail, even details of things that aren't important. And what happens is they end up spending so long on the project that actually this reduces the productivity. And also being really fussy about those details can also turn you into a workaholic, which then can make you less productive in the long run. And the number one challenge for perfectionists procrastination. So perfectionists tend to put things off because they're waiting for the right time for it to be perfect or the right context. And they might then end up actually putting the tasks off constantly or avoiding them altogether. So that article was written by Charles Mbrugu. I hope I pronounced the name correctly, at careeraddict.com. And of course, I'll put it in the show notes. So those are some of the downsides and the pitfalls of perfectionism. And the good news is, if you recognise any of them in you or people that you deal with, we've got some solutions coming up. But first, this. Now, as you may know, I've been sharing some of my favourite podcasts with you in our episodes. And these are podcasts that are not necessarily related to getting better. They're just things that are interesting or make me laugh. Now, if you follow my Twitter feed, then you'll know that one podcast that I'm always retweeting is Super PP Time. Now, straight away, I know that the name gives you a sense that this is not exactly highbrow intellectual comedy, and you'd be right. It is simply two blokes called Jeff and Cade using a voice changer and making up random stories with the aim of making the other person laugh. And it's brilliant. It's, it's silly. It's not complicated, and it makes me laugh until I cry. Now, they kindly agreed to let me play a snip from an episode to share with you. So, get ready. Here it is. But we are so excited to have you all tuning in today. These products are absolutely going to twinkle your nodules. So let's get going, Wilhelmina. Uh, that's right. Uh, we got a we got a, a, a great old couple of things here. That's not really a way to say anything. There's no <laughs> reason to talk not this too way. Good, no. No, let me take it down a notch. Maybe bring myself to...
And that's and that's what it says on the side of the cereal box. Uh, <laughs> Uncle Go- Gopher's Hammer Flakes. Um, <laughs> this uh, this cereal, this cereal box right here. It has the steps on it right here, and uh, this can be used in your community or in a sh- a shack that you find underground. <laughs> <laughs> which, which you won't. I mean, there's just no, God, I hope you won't. I mean, there's no chance. How are you going to find an underground shack? I mean, <laughs> well, if it has a wooden, I mean, you could call any underground structure that has wooden like supports really a shack. <laughs> this is such a good semantic argument to get into. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you might think at first, what the heck is this? And you're probably right. But trust me, listen to a couple of episodes and you'll be hooked. There's nothing else quite like it out there. It's a bit Marmite. You will either really like it or you'll really hate it. But it makes me giggle. And I'll end with a quote from one of their tweets. Let your heart guide you right to where the motorised dogman built a treehouse out of organic bare face sauce. Then ask, why did you guide me here? And your heart will say, I wasn't talking to you. Okay, so what have we learned so far? We've learned that perfectionism is bad, but there are scales from adaptive to maladaptive. And then we've learned there are three different kinds of perfectionism. There's self-oriented, other-oriented, and socially prescribed. We know that there are possibly connections between the socially prescribed kind, which is perpetuated by social media, and mental health issues. And we've discovered that it's a growing problem. Finally, we've learned that even if you aren't affected by mental health issues on a day-to-day basis, perfectionism is just not helpful, despite some people claiming it's a great quality to have. So, how do we solve it? Well, it depends on, first of all, who the perfectionist is. So is it you? Or is it someone that you're having to deal with? Here are some solutions for both. Firstly, in terms of dealing with a colleague or a boss or other people at work or even in your personal life, I found a great article on, um, on this at Psychology Today. So this article was written by Alan A. Caviola, who wrote a book with Dr. Neil Lavender, which was called Impossible to Please. Alan refers to this characteristic as a, an obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And he talks about how challenging it can be to be around these people because they're nitpicky, they can't delegate. And they often use the phrase, if you want something done right, do it yourself. So here are the six tips in dealing with perfectionism in other people. Number one, agree with the criticism but then ask what they'd like you to do differently. So this way, the person's got the opportunity to see if there is a genuine alternative to whatever it is they're finding fault in within you, and it might be a moment for them to see whether their criticism is fair. Tip number two. Basic one this. If you want to keep your job, um, you might need to say that you're a team player and then find a way of sharing your frustrations outside of work with a trusted friend or even a counsellor. But tip number three is if you feel it is appropriate to disagree with a person and you want to stick to your guns, then keep it factual. Don't criticise them, but just state the facts as you know them and then move on. Tip number four, protect your frame of mind by not buying into their criticism. So remind yourself about how you performed based on facts, not this person's criticisms. Number five, because these people can be distracting and they can send you on diversions, Come up with your own goals and work on them to get your own sense of achievement so you don't feel like you've spent the whole day chasing your tail. And finally, number six, find a mentor or a coach somewhere else to support you. So people with this quality tend to not be particularly good at coaching or mentoring, and it is important for us to get coaching. So you can try to find someone else in your business or even look externally at professional organisations or mentors. So 
So that's six tips on how to deal with a colleague, a boss, or even a friend who's a controlling perfectionist. I'll put the link to Alan's Psychology Today article in the show notes. And if you want to read more, I'll also put the link to the book written by Alan and Neil Lavender called Impossible to Please. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Now you might find that you also have challenges if you manage someone who is a perfectionist. And there's a great piece at the Harvard Business Review on how to deal with that particular kind of situation too. I won't go into huge detail here. I'll put that in the show notes. So there are some ideas on dealing with someone else at work or in a relationship who is a perfectionist. But what about if it's you? (laughs) So what about if you recognize some of these qualities in yourself? How do you deal with your own perfectionism? Now, again, there's lots of resource out there to help you. I just have to say at this point, please don't consider my suggestions as relevant. If things really feel out of control for you, please do speak to a professional. But that being said, if you're just struggling a bit with a few of these qualities, or you just want to work on being less irritated by your own nitpickiness, then here are some ideas that might help. So I've taken these top 10 tips from various different places. I'll put the links to all the research in the show notes, but here are my top 10 ways of dealing with your own perfectionism. Number one, baby steps. So I've talked about this before. If you've got a big project, something that feels overwhelming to the perfectionist, that's even harder to get started. So to kick that procrastination into touch, break the project down into baby steps, and then just do one of them. You can use the Pomodoro technique to help or just find one small thing and do it for five minutes. It's remarkable how that can get you going. Tip number two, focus on what's enjoyable. So if the whole thing is overwhelming or it's too much, what bits of it can you enjoy instead of trying to be perfect at the whole thing? Tip number three, be self-aware. So if you find that you are saying or doing things that we've talked about, then Journal them at the time if you can, ideally, or if you can't do it at the time, at the end of the day. So review your day and note how many times have you put something off or found fault or been intolerant of your mistakes or other people's mistakes. And this then leads on to tip number four. Focus on the positive. Once you find yourself finding fault, find five other things that are good. So this can be about yourself. This can be about work. This can be about other people. Developing this habit of as soon as you recognize that you're finding fault, immediately trying to find five other things that are good. Tip number five, meditate. So often perfectionism comes from this chatter in our minds. It's this sort of self-talk, convincing ourselves that we're not good enough or that other people aren't good enough. And meditation is a great way to reduce the noise of that chatter and to think more clearly. Tip number six, focus on the journey and not the destination. So this is the idea of enjoying the ride as well. What have you enjoyed or what have you achieved on the way? And if you combine this with baby steps, you can get a real sense of achievement instead of fretting on the whole thing not being perfect. Tip number seven, record the progress, not the target. So to help you focus on the journey, stop measuring only how far away you are from the goal, because this will feed the idea of failure. Instead, whatever it is you're working on, Work at recording how far you've progressed as well. How far have you moved on from where you were before? That can really drive the motivation to keep going. Tip number eight, laugh. (laughs) And do it a lot. Humour releases tension. And if you can direct some laughter at yourself, you can make life more fun and reduce the pressure. Tip number nine, get inspired by dreamers and risk takers. So here's three stories of failure. There was an author that took seven years to get a book published and it got rejected by 12 different publishing houses. It then only came out in a 1,000 copy edition, half of which went into libraries. That's not much of a success, is it? There was a guy who set up a company called Trafo Data and he tried to sell the idea to Seattle County who weren't interested and the business failed. And then there was another person who was described by his teacher as being too stupid to learn anything, he then went on to get sacked from his first two jobs for not being productive enough. So these people failed multiple times 
and they took risks, and sometimes risks don't pay off. But if you keep going, despite not being perfect, you can eventually get there. The author was J.K. Rowling, whose book about a character called Harry Potter has done quite well. The Trafo data man was Bill Gates, and the school failure who wasn't productive was Thomas Edison. Tip number 10. This final tip from me is quite, it's quite a big one for me, actually. But it's developing the ability to accept that you cannot control everything and surrender to it. <laughs> now, it's easier to say than it is to do. I was often driven by the belief that I was responsible for all the outcomes that happened around me in my life. Everything that happened, I was responsible for it. And of course, it's much easier to claim the successes and harder to accept that uh, you might have played a smaller part in those successes than you think. But there is a tremendous peace of mind that comes when you realise that you can't control everything. In fact, you can only control two things, what you think and what you do. So it's okay not to be perfect. Actually, do you know what? I think it's better. You get more done, you're probably going to be a nicer person, and you get to enjoy the ride. So I say, let's rebel against what fairground attraction tell us. Don't try to be perfect. We'll never get there. If you recognise a little bit of you and what we've talked about, try the tips, have a look at the resources, and remember, you can aim for excellence, you can aim for good, or you could just aim to be a bit better than the person that you were yesterday. Bye-bye. All the links, resource and articles I've used in this episode will be in the show notes right there on your device. Hopefully you'll find them helpful and useful and hopefully you'll find this whole podcast helpful and useful. I hope you do and I do spend a lot of time and effort making sure it's relevant, helpful and entertaining enough for you to listen to. If you agree and you'd like to show your support, there are several ways you can do it. You could go to iTunes and give us a five-star rating or a great review, which would be fab. Alternatively, you can share the podcast on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. We are at Sharp Podcast, one word, two Ps. Or you could even show someone how to subscribe on their phone or their device. And finally, on the website, sharppodcast.com, you can leave feedback, subscribe or go and listen to the archive episodes. I'm off. I hope you're able to find one thing before our next episode that you can do, which will help you get better. And remember, don't waste time comparing yourself to anyone else. The only person you should try to be any better than is the person that you were yesterday. Bye-bye. One take wonder. Okay. I think we're going to go. Um... So I was, uh, and it won, uh, and it won, um, um, uh, um, but that, uh, um, um, so I was, um, um, well, that was interesting, wasn't it? Let's start again. <laughs>